Tonight's program is focused on personalized medicine and the use of artificial intelligence and cancer. And those come together in some really interesting ways. Our new technologies in, in recent years have really told us a great deal about the genes we carry. And that's helped us to better predict the risk of various diseases, the potential efficacy of treatments we might use for those diseases. Scientists are now also looking at the genome, genomes of the cancers themselves that might be resistant to treatment so we can better understand why and when and what we can do about that. A few groups are now using artificial intelligence in this domain to sharpen our understanding of the cancer, of the cancer genome. And that might mean better prediction of prognosis, better targeting of treatment. And we are really fortunate to have one of the leaders in bringing all of that together, um, Trey Eidecker, professor at UC San Diego. More on him is in your program, so I'm going to leave it there so he can get started. So thank you. Okay, well, welcome everybody, and thanks, Michael, for that great introduction. And, and as Michael already alluded to, um, it's, it's really hard to live in our society and read the news, if you're at all reading the news, um, although sometimes you don't want to read the news these days. Um, but, but some of the happier news and some of the more exciting news you'll, you'll read from time to time has to do with some of the stunning advancements in AI or artificial intelligence. And then separately, you'll read about some of the stunning advances in precision medicine, and especially as applied to genetic diseases uh, like cancer. And as we'll talk about in just a moment, cancer is definitely a so-called genetic disease of, of your DNA. And uh, I'm not the only lab uh, uh, that's, that's at this intersection. There's many of us at this intersection. But, but there's real potential for putting some of the advances in in what's called machine learning, which is a part of artificial intelligence, together with, with some of these advances in sequencing cancer, DNA, to really try to figure out what is your personal diagnosis, so not just do you have cancer, you probably know that, uh, or, or not, uh, but, but what kind of cancer do you have, and, and most important, how do you, how do you treat it? So really, um, I've got 30 minutes here, but of course we have an hour after, after that, I understand. Um, but, but for 30 minutes, I'm going to tell you a bit about, first, cancer. So I'm going to start at the end of my title here. Um, just to make sure we're all on the sort of same page with, with why it's exciting to be a cancer researcher and especially a cancer genetics researcher these days. And then uh, 15 minutes in or so, I'll pivot to AI. And then at the very end, I'll start to put it together. But my guess is that's going to spill over into, into the Q&A. So first of all, just to make sure everyone is on the same page with respect to, to cancer. Cancer is largely considered a disease of mutations to the genome. Now, some smart people in the audience may object, and you're free to do that at some point, but most people agree that, that the best model we have right now for cancer is a picture that looks like the following. And by the way, for the slides, I've, I think in every case when I'm using someone else's slide, as I am supposed to do for your reference, you can see where I've, where I've taken these, these slides. So, so in many cases, I'm borrowing images from textbooks uh, like, like this one. And so, so from the Cancer 101 textbook here, the idea is when you're born, you as likely as not, uh, except in rare cases, do not have cancer. And so you have a body full of normal cells. And in this very simplistic model, uh, what happens at some point uh, in, in, in perhaps all of our lives, that's debatable, we accrue mutations. And a few of those mutations cause that cell or that population of cells to grow more rapidly. We're now to the, the right side of that first row. And at some point, you start to call that more rapidly dividing uh, part of your body a tumor. It's growing bigger, uh, out, outsized in proportion to, to the surrounding tissue. And, uh, and uh, sometimes your body can tolerate that growth uh, for a while. But what you really don't want to have happen is for that uh, or part of that tumor to break off uh, and, and uh, become so-called metastatic to other sites in your body, distal or other than, than where the cancer originally developed. But the important uh, uh, sort of idea for the rest of my talk is this notion of continual buildup of mutations to your DNA. And it's, it's really the rare mutation 
They cause the cells to grow faster, uh, but it happens uh, 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 essentially uh, behind everyone's cancer uh, uh, if, if it develops. And so that leads us to the question, well, how do we identify those mutations? And uh, so this is the first technology I'll invoke in, in what is, is largely a technology talk spanning genetics to computer science. Uh, so, so back in, does anyone know when the first human genome was sequenced? I'm probably, I don't know if I'm supposed to be interactive at this point, but what the, what the hey. Uh, does anyone know when, when the first human genome sequence was, was, was published? Was it 2003? Uh, I, I thought it was 2001, but we're close. Uh, and, and so, so starting in, in a early part of this, this, uh, this millennium, we had the human genome uh, sequenced in one or two copies. And, and since 2001, 2003, we've seen an explosion in the number of genome sequences that are available even publicly to scientists like, like us. Um, and application of this technology to, to diseases. Part of what's also happened during the first decade of the 2000s was the cost of, of, of DNA sequencing came way, way down. So after that first human genome, which took 30 years to plan and develop technology to sequence, in the next 10 years, genomes came down in price to under $10,000. And now, arguably, your genome would cost about $1,000 to $2,000 to sequence, depending on who you, you send your material to. And I am not uh, at all uh, employed by or sharing stock in Illumina, uh, but, but I think all of, all of Syria's scientists would agree that Illumina has cornered the market on genome sequencing. A point of interest, if you go to UTC Mall and take a right by Crate and Barrel, Illumina's campus is there. It is a local company. You can be proud that you're living in, in San Diego where, where literally the, the monopoly uh, on genome sequencing currently exists. This is one of the, not the latest machine, but certainly a state-of-the-art Illumina machine that, that sequences DNA. I'm not going to give a lecture on the biochemistry of sequencing DNA. Um, how, many, how many base pairs, so, so just to, again, be clear, DNA is made up of letters. A, C, G, T, adenine, guanine, cytidine, thymidine. We just typically say A, C, G, T. How many letters are making up the chromosomes in your, in your DNA? Anyone, wanna, anyone know? Uh, three billion. It three billion. So three times 10 to the ninth letter spread out over uh, your, your X or Y sex chromosomes and then your so-called autosomes, the other chromosomes. Uh, and so, so to a first approximation for about a thousand bucks, Illumina can read out that, that sequence. Now what does it all mean is going to be the key question that we're going to need AI for in just, in just a little bit. And, and of course, the talks about cancer, so what does it all mean in cancer? So, so uh, armed with that Illumina technology, now, uh, so 2001, first genome sequence, now we're like in the mid-2000s, uh, late 2000s, the American National Cancer Institute, which is a branch of the National Institutes of Health, NIH, started a absolutely, what, what in retrospect, now the, now the project is, is over and done, uh, was an absolute transformative idea and project. It was called the Cancer Genome Atlas, which those of us in the, in the sort of science affectionately call the TCGA, or we're just gonna ramble off TCGA. Uh, so the Cancer Genome Atlas set out to sequence representatives, about 500 patient or tumor biopsies from those 500 patients, okay, um, for a bunch of different representative tumor tissue types. Okay, and, and uh, the project got more ambitious after it got started. If you look in the public data, some, some of the data are public, I should say, but publicly you can access way upwards of 10,000 cancer genomes in this day and age. And if you Google TCGA, it's pretty cool. Literally, you're like three clicks away from like looking at individual cancer genomes that were part of this, this project. So, so we, uh, we now have tens of thousands of, of, of cancer genomes. And the question is, uh, what are the genes 
that uh, have, have experienced mutations by that model I just described. So presumably we should now be getting mutations in, in some of our genes that, that are, causing, are causing cancer. And indeed we are. Uh, and, 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 and lots and lots and lots of papers have been published and are continuing to be published about this. But here's one such plot that I pulled out of this random publication here uh, uh, in, the upper, in the upper left, where you, you have uh, on, on one axis, a bunch of genes, these, these, uh, these letters like TP53 and TSHZ3, VHL, and so on, are codes for genes in the three billion uh, base pairs of our genome. These are little functional elements um, called genes and uh, uh, that were found to be mutated in multiple cancer patients, okay? Um, and the other axis here in this plot is in what tissue type those genes are most often found to be mutated. Again, it's in code. Um, if you're in the field, you learn to recognize these. OV, what tissue, what cancer type you think does OV stand for? Ovarian cancer. Um, sometimes we guess LUSC, lung squamous carcinoma um, is my guess, <laughs> right? Uh, and, and you get the idea. Uh, BLCA blood, or sorry, bladder cancer. BRCA, breast cancer, you get it. Okay, so, so then we have uh, some tissue types here on the, on the one axis. The important cancer genes that were found from analysis of these tens of thousands of cancer genome sequences. And then the bars are, uh, the height of the bar is not just what percent of the patient population has that, that mutation. And so but judging from the bar height only here, what is the most important gene on this whole slide? TP53, it is the most infamous cancer gene that there is, okay? Um, but what you can also see is, first of all, I can tell you right now, that one mutated gene appears in, in over half of cancer, okay, across these tissue types. Uh, in fact, that's what the pan-cancer bar shows, about half of cancers have TP53. Um, but other than that, look how many other genes are involved, and it turns out this is just probably the tip of the iceberg. So you have a whole pattern of, of, of gene mutations that are cropping up in any one uh, uh, patient's uh, mu uh, uh, mutational spectrum in their genome, um, much less as you start to look across these different cancer types. So the mutational landscape of cancer is complicated. Is it surprising that it's complicated? No, I mean, biology is complicated, life is complicated, and, and so, is, so, is, so is cancer. Uh, based on that encouraging set of findings, though, we now have clinical diagnostic tests. So, so, so TCGA, I should point out, is not a clinical, actionable thing. It's a research study. These are, these are volunteers who decided to, to you know, allow their genomes to be subjected to a research study. The question is now, uh, what about applying the sequencing technology to, to cancer patients uh, in real time? And that's also happening. So the FDA has now, is slowly, but, but has now, uh, as of a couple of years ago, approved a few tests. Again, I am not at all related to Foundation One in, in, in any way, but again, I, it's just one of a couple of tests that's available. This is uh, on the FDA's website. Uh, your physician can order this test. It doesn't pay for the entire genome of your cancer biopsy to be sequenced. Turns out insurance doesn't pay for that. That's not actually a diagnostic test yet, although you can, by the way, you can elect to have it done anyway. Feel free to talk about that later, of whether you should have, have it done uh, and, 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 and if, if it's worth the money. Uh, but, but certainly for about 300 or so genes, this is a subset of those genes. You can, I, I don't know, what is this, 30 genes or 20 to 30 genes shown here. Uh, 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 for those and a, and a few hundred more, uh, you can get sequence of those via an FDA approved test. So that's interesting. Um, and, and the vision that, that then this, this enables is something like this, and again, this is from, from a textbook. Uh, and and this, is, this is really, is this current practice of medicine? It's becoming perhaps current practice of medicine, as you'll see, if we can figure out what's really going on in the genome. Okay, but, but the vision at least is that, you know, in the, in the cancer clinic of the near future or present, depending on, on what tumor type you have and what clinic you're in, your patient, say, checks in with primary breast, with you know, breast tumors, 
um, you, you do a biopsy of that, and uh, the middle arrow here shows that you are going to just directly sequence the DNA of that breast tumor to find what genes are mutated. Where are the mutations in this, in this particular patient? And hint, it's, even for one patient, it's, it's not just one gene. It's, it's typically dozens to hundreds of genes that you see embedded you know, like, like shotgun pellets, mutations in, in those genes. Um, you also, it turns out now, there's a technology called uh, 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 tumor-derived xenografts where you'll take that, uh, a piece of that person's tumor, uh, stick it in a mouse, you'll just sort of put it under the skin of a mouse, grow it, and then uh, uh, expose that mouse to tons of different possible therapies and see which ones help cure your cancer now modeled inside of a, you know, under a mouse subcutaneously, and which therapies don't respond. Um, and again, you can sequence uh, uh, your tumor again from that mouse at any point in that process. And then if you were unlucky enough uh, that your initial treatment doesn't work, and later you, you find that your cancer has unfortunately metastasized to other parts of your body, like your brain, uh, then, uh, then you can begin to, to, as you biopsy those, you can also use genome sequencing to look at, okay, why did, it, why did it all of a sudden metastasize? It was stable before, and often what happens is other mutations have occurred. Um, not always, but, but sometimes you'll find other mutations that you can associate with, with metastasis. So this is, I think, a powerful slide of, of where we'd like to go in precision medicine. Um, and, and we're just not quite, quite there yet. So let's, let's talk about why, uh, why not. And uh, the, the big word of the day on everyone's lips that's been on everyone's lips uh, for at least five years is heterogeneity. Uh, I've already alluded to it uh, uh, in, in multiple ways. Um, but, but the problem is beyond TP53, which everyone noticed that's almost always mutated, or at least you know, in, in 50% of tumors, you have typically, a patient uh, will have typically 100, say, depending on the cancer type, round about 100 other genes that are mutated, many of which have never before been seen to be mu mutated in any other patient, okay? It's hard to absorb that, that, that it's, it, there's a big space of genes out there, three billion base pairs. It's actually not hard to get a pattern of mutations that's simply unique on this earth and, and you know, not just at the present time, but overall time. We're all individuals with unique DNA. Is it any surprise that our cancer also has unique DNA from every, every other individual cancer? So we're all snowflakes, and our cancers are all snowflakes. If you get a population of patients, uh, every tumor looks, looks different. And then people, it turns out, are even now discovering that even in your single patient, even in your tumor, if you take a cell over here and sequence its DNA and compare it to a cell you know, somewhere else in that cancer tissue, that might have even a different pattern of DNA. And so heterogeneity is, is the problem. Um, just to say it in another way, there are just too many patterns of mutations that cause cancer or combinations of those mutations that cause cancer for humans to presently understand. And in the, in the words of Eric Lander, who was one of the visionary leaders who started the Human Genome Project and, and, and helped complete the Human Genome Project, Human Genome bought the book, Difficult to Read. Um, and, and nowhere does that quote apply better than in, in trying to understand cancer, cancer mutations. Um, this, so now I'm at the point in my talk, I promise, where I'm going to pivot and talk about AI. Uh, and the reason is because I'm, I'm now talking about patterns. I've got a DNA sequence, and I've got a particular pattern. It's different for every uh, cancer patient. Uh, but that's exactly what, what artificially intelligent uh, devices or, or, or programs have been designed, and it turns out now with, with so-called advances in, in, in so-called deep learning, are pretty good. Uh, at, at, at doing in terms of recognizing patterns that are hard for humans to appreciate, but, but the machine can, can see. And so what, what some of us, and again, I'm not alone in this, have, have dreamed up is, wow, wouldn't it be great if I had some, some software, some artificially intelligent machine learning software, I'll put in that black box, and I teach this thing uh, how to take a cancer genome and its list of mutated genes and output what subtype of cancer you have and what drug to give. 
So can I learn to associate genomes with drugs? Okay, and the reason why, why this type of, this sort of framework or paradigm occurs to us is because this exact kind of input-output learning exercise is what AI does best. Let me, let me just give you some examples. I'm really shifting gears here, but then, but then we're going to come back and put it all to, uh, together. So you, you might have, have noticed that uh, supposedly deep learning or, or machine learning systems have now beat the grandmaster at chess. They've, they've beat the grandmaster of Go. They've won Jeopardy. Okay, um, so they're good at game playing, where the input is your current game position, and then the output is the next move. Um, they're very good at speech recognition. You might have noticed Siri's getting pretty good, although still not perfect. Um, image recognition, uh, robotics, and so on. And, and it's very, very similar to, to all of these kind of problems are very, very similar to, to what you'd want to do in, in cancer. And I'll just give you one example of an absolute triumph of, of artificial intelligence, cats on the internet. So, so it, it, I find it still, to this day, absolutely remarkable that you can go to Google, click on images. I don't know if you can read what I've done here, OK? Um, it's not hard, <laughs> right? Click on images, type cat, and with 100% accuracy, it will return to you pages and pages and pages of cats. And I was not able in my, in my exercise here to find a mistake, okay? So again, imagine if I could paste in your cancer genome and with, with, with that precision, it gave me successful drug one, successful drug two, successful drug three. Okay, um, it's really good at taking an image and learning. So there again, what, what researchers have done is they've given it thousands of cat images where they say it's a cat, thousands of images of cucumbers where they say it's a cucumber, and it learns to tell the difference from the pattern of bits in those, in those images. It's really at a high level similar to what you want to do in cancer genomics. Um, okay, so now um, everything should be great, right? I'm going to just take all my cancer genomes. I told you I have at least 10,000. It's more like 40 or 50,000 uh, in uh, end of 2020, say. I'm going to take those 20, 20 50,000 genomes. I'm going to, uh, from, for some of those cases, I might know what drugs worked, what drugs didn't. I'm going to now train the thing to learn. This genome prescribes this drug. This genome prescribes this drug, and so on. Well, not so, not so easy, and, and I'm going to talk about a couple of challenges that's made people hesitate. Either hesitate for ethical reasons or, or hesitate for technological reasons. Um, the first set of challenges uh, has to do with uh, the fact that when I'm, when I'm talking about a box here, I'm just saying we have some machine learning uh, wizardry in that box. Essentially, uh, people these days use what are called artificial neural nets or neural networks, among other frameworks that we can talk about. But they're all, uh, uh, for the most part, so-called black, black box devices, meaning you don't want to open up that hood to look at what, what the computer is actually doing uh, because the, the, the artificial system, artificial brain essentially grown in there in that artificial neural net is just not interpretable. Okay, it's, it's very, very hard for, for even the computer scientists who create these things to know what the heck is going on behind that curtain. Even in cases where it's very good at taking the input and saying it's a cat. We have no idea why that cat classifier works. That's the bottom line. It works, we don't know why it works. And so, so that's fine for cats on the internet, perhaps, um, but as you may appreciate, Generally in biomedicine, we want to understand <laughs> the predictions we make. That gives you trust. It's, it's the so-called trust problem in artificial intelligence. Without saying why you're diagnosing your cancer as this luminal subtype that's going to respond to this set of drugs and be resistant to this set of drugs, you need to tell the doctor and the patient why. Okay? It's because it's this seven gene combination that told me that. Okay? Um, machine learning, not good at doing that right now. Now, it turns, so here's a, here's a classic now example from just a couple of years ago published by a University of Washington uh, uh, computer science team that explains why this, is, why this is hard and why it's dangerous to, to think that just because your predictions are good 
that you can figure out uh, rational reasons why those predictions are, are being made. So I just talked about an example with cats. The example they, uh, uh, they used here is dogs versus wolves. So if I go back to, to Google Images and I repeat my experiment, my, my experiment, I type wolf, it will not give you a dog. It's remarkably good at scope, you know, whatever, scraping off the internet images and saying that's a wolf. Okay, but now, now, why exactly? How does it know that this is a wolf, right? So I think, right? Let's just let's just make sure we're all on the same page with the algorithm. Uh, wolf, dog. Yes. <laughs> uh, what's the third one? Wolf, wolf, dog, wolf, and then I, I don't know why there's an X there. I think that's the one I got wrong in this in this paper. Uh, dog. Okay, so we're pretty good. It's really good at it too at the prediction. Now they figured out in this paper why. Anyone want to? So 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 yeah. Do you want to guess what what the answer is? How did the machine learning algorithm? Distinguish dog from wolf. Snow in the background. So basically, it's asking: Is the are the pixels in the lower left corner and the lower right corner of the image white? Okay. So so the the, the analogy of cancer would be you know it comes up with some actually there's, there's a great analogy not from not from cancer genome analysis but from cancer image analysis. It turned out the radio the radiographic imaging device was printing the name of the manufacturer of that imaging system in the lower left of the image with the date. And it turned out that that updated imaging system was better at detecting some kind of cancers. And so it just made it more likely to call the image without even looking at the patient. OK, so just, you know, I, 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 I can go on and on and digress some more. But, but it's really important for the machine not just to get the right answer but for the machine to tell you and know why and have the right reason why it's getting the right answer. So, so clearly what you want, just like your brain is doing, you know, how, how do we know that the, the, the left thing is a, is, a, is, a, is a wolf, that upper left? It's not the snow. Well, perhaps, perhaps your brain used snow, but I would argue it's a bunch of other things and cues as well, right? Like, like what else would you use to sort of say wolf? There's a pack, very good. I would, I would say it's slinking around in a sort of animalistic way that a dog doesn't usually do. Um, anything else? Tail. tail, yeah, the tail position, exactly. It's tucked firmly beneath its legs, which is, is not what a normal, you know, happy-go-lucky dog would do, right? OK. Um, so that's, problem. Th that's the biggest problem I want to discuss here today is the black box nature of AI that makes it really hard to, to, to have compatibility with biomedical health care. Okay? Um, the other problem is that, is that cancer data, we, we talk about big data in medicine and all of that, but cancer data actually are not as big as the number of cat images on the internet and things like that. You simply don't have the number of examples to train this thing that you'd like to have. And, in, and if you think about it, uh, uh, it's easy to understand why. If you're trying to, uh, if you look at the, the, the domains in which machine learning and artificial intelligence have, have shined, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's things like playing games or driving cars, perhaps, or, or finding cats and wolves in images, where if you need more data, just play more Go games. Just go take more pictures of cats. Scrape the web some more, right? What about cancer genomes? Well, like I said, we have, a, after 15 years of effort, um, yes, genome sequencing is getting cheaper all the time, but still, there aren't, you know, there, there isn't the volume of cancer patients that, that you would, I mean, fortunately, <laughs> that, that, that you would need to train these things. And, and certainly, you know, there's, there's how many billion people on the planet um, uh, you know, uh, a few percent of which have cancer, that's going to that's gonna be the upper bound on the number of training examples you can ever feed your AI. So it's a, it's a very different amount of data, even if we, we think about it as big biomedical data, it's not as big as, as, as mainstream computer science has access uh, to, for sure. And, and the third sort of challenge that I think is worth discussing is, if, is the other or sort of a, a final 
uh, significant difference between tasks that machine learning is good at doing now and what we're trying to do in, in precision medicine. And, and in particular, tasks that machine learning is good at doing now are things that humans are already good at doing. Okay, we just were talking about the, the computer has successfully matched our predictive and maybe slightly exceeded our human brain's ability to predict cats in images. But we're all pretty good at finding cats too. We're all, some of us are better than others, but we're all able to play games, <laughs> right? And, and so uh, drive cars, we're actually way better than computers at the present time at driving, at driving cars. But these are all tasks that we're simply trying to simulate uh, 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 a, a human behavior for. Whereas, let's think about cancer genome diag diagnosis. The whole problem, the whole reason that we're talking about this is that MDs have no idea how to, how to diagnose your cancer genome and to match it to a drug. And so this is not simulating a thing an MD knows how to do. In fact, if that's the goal, in fact, there, there have been attempts by, for instance, IBM. They had, they had for a while this sort of deep blue uh, a precision medicine system that was largely, it was sort of like Jeopardy. It was, it was good at playing medical Jeopardy. So if, if, if the task was to sort of pull out uh, arcane facts about your patient that could be gleaned from medical literature, it was pretty good. Um, but that's not the thing. We're, we're not talking about things that are in the literature or that a doctor knows how to do. We're trying to do the unknown. And so, so uh, that's, that's really the, the challenge. I think I'm, I'm out of time, Michael. Yeah, so in, in fact, it's actually a good time. I, I think I'll just, I'll just quickly go to discussion because what I was now gonna talk about is, is some ways my lab is, is now trying to move forward to make interpretable neural networks and these, these machine learning systems so they're not black boxes. Um, but but I, think, I think maybe for the purposes of, of what you want to accomplish here, we might just start discussing. Um, what, do you, what do you guys think? Let's, let's do that. Knowing that information is not perfect and you may not know what to do with the information, um, how many of you think that if you had cancer, you would want to have that cancer sequenced? And, and you would pay a couple thousand for it out of pocket. Hands still up? <laughs> it, it looks like most people. Yeah. No, this is fascinating. I don't know what the factors are. I know that I had that choice when I was diagnosed with cancer. And I erred on the side of saying, basically, what we know about treatments right now is that I'm on the treatment that's the best. So I didn't decide to go for that. Um, but I guess if it had been a cancer for which treatment was of uncertain help, then why not try? Yeah, that's, and that might be the way people were, were thinking about that. Um, so. Another question that um, came to my mind was, um, is thinking about this black box. So that's really what you're working on. And in order to get that black box trained up, you need um, ideally a lot of patients to contribute their DNA for their cancer. Um, what is the limiting step now? Is it money, people willing to provide their data? What, what's limiting in terms of how many patients you get? So, so I think in terms, of, in terms of the amount of patient data, given there's a limited number of patients, because for machine learning, we're talking, you know, when you say I need to train my model, you're talking millions of data points that you typically need, depending on how complex the problem is. And of course, I think we'd all agree, cancer is at least as complex as Go or, or a, you know, an image uh, of a cat, um, probably many orders of magnitude more so. So, so it's clear we're going to need a lot of data. Um, I, uh, I think the, the, the data sets for cancer genomes that have been sequenced are very impressive. And more are coming down the pike all the time. And I think we have to assume that people will continue to get federal research grants to, to generate more of, of those data. Um, so I think the issue is, is, is uh, not do we have enough cancer genomes, it's more that there are not, there simply aren't enough cancer genomes. And, and how are we going to train a system on such limited, limited data? 
Uh, and, and one thing I didn't talk about that, that our lab, and I should say, raise, raise your hand, guys. There's two <laughs> lab members here, Jisoo Park and Brent Kunsi, who are doing exactly what, what I'm about to talk about, uh, uh, at least briefly mention, which is we're, we're trying to turn the black box model into an open system, or what we're calling visible AI. And uh, which looks much more like a model of a cancer cell where the inner workings are not obscured, but, uh, but you actually can point to explanations for why the, the model makes its predictions. Uh, for instance, um, in, in their research, you know, they found that, that uh, one set of, uh, of genomes is resistant to a drug, and the reason for that drug resistance is because you have mutations in this particular gene circuit in, in the cell um, having to do with metabolism. And, and so, so that at least starts to become an explanation, hey, you don't want to, if you mutate glucose metabolism, or if your cancer has mutated glucose metabolism as a way of evolving, then, um, then you can expect that uh, that through, through now understandable, relatable biochemical reasons uh, causes resistance to certain kinds of drugs and sensitivity to, to other kinds of drugs that, that for instance, uh, 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 target metabolic pathways. So that's our research strategy is I think we've got to get rid of the black box um, and, and that, uh, uh, that whole sort of research thread of how do we build AI systems that are interpretable, that are not black boxes, turns out to be, to be uh, echoed in mainstream machine learning. There's a bunch of great literature that's come out in the past year or two um, on, on how you develop uh, interpretable machine learning systems in other, other domains. Um, a, another one I just never, never thought about that uh, where, where interpretation becomes key is in, if you, if you can believe it, apparently, um, and this is not my field of expertise, but I'm telling you uh, what, I've, what I've read only, uh, there are machine learning systems that are used in handing down prison sentences. So, so juries convict, but the actual prison sentence, there are some situations where a machine learning algorithm will help decide what's, what sentence the judge should give. And these are currently black boxes, and it's created quite uh, uh, a conundrum, right? So, so anyway, not to not to, to to take this thing totally off the rails, but but there there are there are lots of cases where you're going to need to have um, systems that are interpretable, not black boxes. Yeah, I would. So that's a very accessible example of the risks of black box. There's a, an economist, Nobel Prize winning economist Daniel Kahneman. Some of you may have heard of. Um, he talks about um, from from work from others about the idea of doing a pre mortem where you basically, before things have gone bad, say, what could possibly go wrong? How bad could it be to try and figure out what the issues might be? And when I hear about prison sentences, for example, the black box is training on existing data. Exactly. So it's going to make predictions based on all about of the recidivism failures. and things like that, yeah, exactly. And so, so we have that same worry to some degree with trying to decide what to do with cancers. And I, I get, as, you, as you went through your talk today, I was starting to think, all right, so we, you've convinced us that what we're talking about is a black box, which makes it an interesting game to say, can we predict which drug routinely based on the particular data set we have? Um, but it's not mechanistic, so there are lots of ways in which you could be coming up with the wrong answer. On the other hand, if we or the have right no, answer for the wrong reasons, yeah, or the yeah. or the right, but well, that that we nobody will probably worry. So as in the, the right snow field and the wolf figure. Yeah, think, exactly. think about the snow field. <laughs> so as long as as long as all wolves have snow fields, we'll be okay. And we won't, <laughs> right. won't get our hand bit, bitten off. Right. But if we're talking about something like cancer, in certain cases, it may well be that um, it's better to try this black box approach than nothing, because we don't have anything better. But, um, but I'm ga gathering from what we've put together here is that because there probably aren't enough cancer patients out there to do a really good, even black box approach, that the best we could argue is that we're going to accumulate data um, knowing that you have to start sometime. And your, your group is trying to dig down a little more deeply to figure out what mechanisms are rather than just saying, here's the answer. Well, and, and, I, and I certainly didn't, but back to start somewhere, 
I certainly didn't mean to imply that no progress is being made yeah. with the current understanding and ability to interpret cancer mutations. There are, every year, there's sort of a, a snowballing, it seems, uh, set of, of targeted drugs that are appearing on, on the shelf um, that, that are targeting uh, so-called oncogenic mutations that cause an, act, you know, an activation of that gene's protein. And so then you want to, you know, when you find that mutation, you want to drug that mutation directly. Um, and then there are other, other drugs that are even appearing that, that target not where the mutation occurred, but some secondary circuit that, uh, that now becomes uh, a vulnerability given the, the way the cancer has evolved. So, so there's actually, uh, you know, so, so one, you know, and, and examples of this are uh, Herceptin is an example of a drug that targets the product of a gene called HER2, which can be amplified in some kinds of breast cancers. And genome sequencing will tell you that. They'll say, uh, you have a HER2 amplification, and therefore uh, that uh, all else being equal, now there may be other factors to consider, but all else being equal, that would indicate that Herceptin would be an effective therapy for that, that patient. And so that's an example of, of, of a success story uh, in, in this kind of genomic precision medicine analysis. Okay, great. Um, I'm turning to some of the questions that people wrote. Um, the first one is getting to where we're going. So um, they're asking, will physicians give up responsibility for the decisions AI genomic studies offer if something goes amiss? And I, I think what they're, I, I'm putting that together, I'm thinking what they're saying is, um, obviously they won't want the responsibility if something went amiss, but what they, the question is, are, they, are we going to basically be cutting physicians out of this? What's their place and role in this, this world we're heading for? As, <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, a, that's above my pay grade. Okay. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, I, I, again, my personal opinion is, uh, and, and I think this reflects uh, uh, sort of a, um, a, a, you know, a, a threat of the argument, at least, that, that physicians can never be out of the loop. We should, we should think about these, and this is also gets back to why these systems can't be black boxes, because you're gonna have to use this system to guide people's understanding. But we're far from, from you know, uh, uh, automatically pulling the trigger on a therapy um, without a physician. I, I think that's not the way forward here, at least in the near future, maybe in some futuristic situation. You would, you would maybe contemplate that, but we're definitely not there yet. Yeah, so for a lot of things that physicians do, um, studies have routinely shown that even experts often have very different answers to the same question. Um, a machine, if you have all the machines trained on the same algorithm, they'll all come up with the same answer. And I, I guess the, the question is when do we, I mean, this is not just a question about cancer, which is one of the harder things you might ask a physician to do. Um, would, would we want a machine to diagnose whether or not we have a, based on our symptoms, whether or not we have a virus or a bacterial, viral or bacterial yeah. infection? Um, and I, I can be, I'm pretty confident that once that machine is in a physician's office, they're going to believe it. They're going to believe it. Because it's, it's real, it's a number, it's, it's sophisticated, it's state of the art. And, and as you alluded to a, a moment ago, and if, if over, over the course of, of you know, recent history, the machine's right most of the time, that's going to lead credibility to the machine. <laughs> um, uh, the, the way that I, I, I think these things could evolve in a healthy, healthy you know, at least in, in, in the context of cancer, in, in a healthy, uh, progressive way is, so, so right now, as you might be aware, Michael, and some people in the audience might sort of know how this works, there's, uh, there's this thing typically called a tumor board, and um, it's, it's like HouseMD. Um, it, it literally is HouseMD for, for the cancer center and, and, you know, anywhere from a half dozen to a dozen uh, cancer clinicians and basic research scientists will sit around a table and consider the difficult cancer cases. Again, these are not the, there's, there's the ones that are very clearly treatable or you at least know what the, what the clear likelihood is of, of a treatment. But then there's others that get referred to a tumor board. And, and so the sort of fanciful idea that, that I would have, and I, I don't think I'm alone, is imagine Siri is sitting at the table. And so, so it's not making a decision, you still have to reach consensus, but Siri is at the table and you say, Siri, my patient has mutations in, you know, MYC 
and TP53 and, and maybe you know, some other gene, what, what drug do you think I should give? And, and I guess your, your fear is Siri will just, everyone will just go with Siri's recommendation. Yeah, well, and, but the good news is Siri won't get upset if the others disagree with Siri. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Unless Siri's programmed. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so this question um, I think anticipates something beyond where we are now, but maybe you can um, refine it a bit. So they're, they're asking about false negatives in cancer diagnosis. Until this day, who is better or more accurate, the human or the machine learning? And I would presume that the machine learning is nowhere near, but let you answer that. But can, can you clarify, so by false negatives? The, the risk of, of not detecting a cancer when it's there. So are humans better right. at saying, you don't have cancer? Then so that's, I mean, I mean, let's even talk about, about that. So, so everything, I've just to be clear, everything I've talked about, you're already, there's no doubt the patient has cancer. You've, yeah, you've right. in fact, you've gotten a, the, the fact you have a tumor sequence or the, a, a genome sequence means the surgeon, unless it's a blood cancer, uh, if it's a solid t tumor type, the surgeons biopsy the tumor. So there's no doubt that you have cancer. You're talking, I think, now about, about perhaps cancer screening yeah. and, and the role of artificial intelligence in, in cancer screening, and I, I I agree, it is a very difficult question. Yeah. So somebody who um, clinically needs, uh, wants information might, as we discussed, decide to have their tumor sequenced to try and get information based on what we know so far that might be helpful. Um, you're doing research to try and get that genomic information to predict which drugs work and which don't. So if a, if a patient who is now a research subject comes to you and says, you can use my DNA for your project. Do you give them information back? And if so, what are the arrangements on how that works? Um, there, was an, there was an earlier project with the Carter Lab, Hannah Carter's lab, guys, where, where Hannah and I were on the, tumors, were on the tumor board, and there were some, um, some people came through where the patient had paid for their human genome to be, or their tumor genome to be sequenced. Turns out you actually sequence it twice because you, you, when you say I have a mutation, that's relative to your normal self, right? You don't know, you know if you just give a sequence, you don't know what's mutated and not. You have to subtract your tumor from your, your normal. So they, they pay, so you're paying twice, basically. But they, they did all of that, and then they wanted to know. You know so, so it became very gray whether it's a research project or, but then the problem is that this person is, has got aggressive cancer and, and their life is on the line, and, and so, uh, it, it became very difficult, I think, uh, it, 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 to work in that blurred area of, of clinical uh, application and research. Uh, since that time, I've stuck to research. Which means that you would, you tell patients who are now subjects of the research up front that you aren't going to get information from we're, us. We're using, yes, we're using, and there's a whole, cons as you know well, there's a whole consenting process and, and we are, you know, uh, uh, on purpose and by law removed from, from that interaction. Yeah. So, um, yeah, because this becomes, you know, this question ends up, the, the reason I thought of this, the question um, is at that intersection between clinical, at some point we will be able to say something useful, and, and so for some people we can now. No, no, you research. could, right, yeah. right, I mean, you could imagine a world in which, in which clinical results, you know, are just coming in real time, and, and, and you have a system that learns, you know, especially if you really went with the machine, if you trusted your machine, the machine is learning all the time in real time. I mean, that, I think the closest thing is this PD, is, is this uh, PDX, I'll stop speaking, and this, is this uh, patient-derived xenograph model where I showed from the textbook how they would implant your tumor in a mouse. That is kind of similar to your question if you think about it, because what's happening is in, the, in this mouse model of your cancer, they're gonna take your, your breast tumor, biopsy it, stick it, on, stick it into a mouse, <clears throat> and then do a bunch of experiments on that mouse um, over the next few weeks to figure out which drugs cause your tumor to respond in the mouse. So that is kind, it's not using precision learning, you know, uh, precision medicine or machine learning in, 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 in a direct way, but it is, it's blurring the lines between clinical and basic research. Yeah, yeah. 
but it is somewhat of a shotgun approach still, and you have to have enough money to run a lot it's of It's a shotgun like approach it. because you're gonna shotgun every drug under yeah, the sun right, right, right. At, 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 at that mouse, or at, at, and I should specify, you're actually creating an entire family of mice, right? Because each drug is gonna be given typically to, to a mouse. Um, so you're creating a litter, <laughs> literally, of, from your cancer. So how scalable this is, again, is, is also a question. Yeah, so um, if I dig further on this question, and you are, my recollection is you are not an MD. <laughs> not an MD. <laughs> so, um, so, and neither am I. Uh, but I know we have at least some in the audience, and maybe one of them might like to come to the microphone and talk a little bit about this. So if you had a patient with cancer, and um, they are interested in getting a sequence, the question is, from an ethical, perspective, ethical point of view, um, it, they are set, making the statement, it is not proper to screen for something for which you can't do anything, e.g. no treatment. So is there, though, some line, as you described it, where you say to that patient, at this point, we don't have knowledge sufficient to say anything useful about your particular cancer, but getting the sequence might, provi sequence might provide information. Could any of the physicians, and some of you I know are to get into ethics quite a bit, like to comment on that, think how we should handle this? If you look on the other side of the card, what I said was, um, how does artificial intelligence fit into this um, general dictum that if you have something that you can't treat, clinically it's not ethical to screen for that. Um, so that's the, the question is really on the other side of the card. Okay, okay that's the, that, the ultimate question, yeah, so. Yeah. Um, so, but I realize part of the answer to my question is really that you're really looking for treatments based upon what you find out uh, genomically and then test it in the xenograph mice. Uh, so, um, my question isn't exactly on target, but I really wanted to know how artificial intelligence would fit into this ethical question. Well, well, I think most directly, it's it's looking for indic for, for complex indications of of disease. So it's so it's looking for patterns of mutations that currently aren't actionable, because because no one knows to recognize that pattern. Um, but but if again, if if the machine um, weren't just making some some um, some prediction without an underlying mechanism, but you actually understood why it was making the prediction, then the, that prediction would migrate into a clinically actionable prediction. And at that point, it ceases to be a magic black box machine learning AI prediction. It, it, it just enters the canon of, 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 or the arsenal of indications you have for that patient. So I think that's kind of where, and, and you know, so one, one exciting trial that, that we're starting to get involved with that, that, that allows for this kind of thing is there's this thing called the iSpy2 uh, trial in, in the state of California, spearheaded by uh, Laura's es two Laura's, Laura's Esserman and Ventvir at UC San Francisco. And um, it's, it's one of the most forward-looking breast cancer uh, oh, you know, genomically-minded trials, I think, around. And again, I'm not, I'm not the Laura's and I'm not an MD, but this is my understanding of, from working with them um, uh, you know, on this project. And, and what they've built in and what, what more and more trials, is my understanding, are, are building in is if you have some diagnostic and that diagnostic doesn't have to be genomic. It can be, there's other kinds. It could be a different, you know, histopathological stain or something, you know. It could be any, but if you have a new diagnostic, there are now ways of retro, first retrospectively evaluating that diagnostic in, in, in currently enrolled patients. But then if you, if you see promising indications with that new diagnostic and now creating and, and changing the clinical trial structure, around that new diagnostic. And so the hope would be with some of the AI-based diagnostics that, that are coming out from these systems we're developing, that now you can start to evaluate those in the context of an ongoing clinical trial. But again, the, the real, I think, um, uh, advance of, 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 of the LARAs is in how they've, they've created that design that lets people like me in basic science evaluate new diagnostics. Good, thanks. Were you uh, waiting for question? I wanted to ask if the black box will have the ability to not just detect cancer, but other um, diseases? Ab ab absolutely, and in fact, where, um, where these black box machine learning systems have already made pretty significant inroads in medicine is in the imaging field. So it, it comes out of the same technology that says that's a cat and that's a cucumber, They've, they've, they've unleashed that general approach on 
here's here's a you know X-ray of this of this patient. What kind of you know what what kind of cancer do they have? So they, there was a paper last year that and this is still cancer, I know, but it's it's a different kind of diagnostic. They have a now there's a machine that looks at a at a picture of your mole, and can tell better than your dermatologist whether that mole is is a melanoma. And, and again, the claims are bold. The claims are this is much better, significantly better than, than your, your dermatologist. Um, and that same idea uh, also applies to other kinds of, of imaging. Okay, so for instance, you know, um, back to MRIs and CAT scans. I think that's where it, any diseases that relates to, to being diagnosed by an image is already feeling the benefits or at least experiencing um, uh, impacts of machine learning. Um, you know, and I think the larger answer to your question is virtually anything that requires decisions could in theory go yeah, through this process, yeah. whether not just medical, but anything. Um, and, and that doesn't mean it's what you want to do. And a good example is the mole thing you just described. So you said that the statement, or the, the belief is that it's, the machine is better than the humans. But I would also want to know not just it's better, but what's the false positive rate, what's the false negative rate. Right. So, for example, it could always detect if it always said it's cancer, right. even when it wasn't. Well, and, 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 and this links back to some other conversations we've had. So the other issue I have with that paper is, is yes, when they feed the doctor a, I don't know what, 100 by 100 pixel image photograph of the mole, okay, but the doctor, of course, isn't peering through a little thing. The doctor is doing a complete examination of the patient and is talking to the patient. And, you know, that wasn't fair to the AI because the AI isn't talking to the patient in this paper. It's just looking at the, at the pixel image. So when you boil it down to such a toy problem, yeah, sure, but that's not the reality. Yeah, that's interesting. Well, anyway, so thanks for a very intriguing talk. My pleasure.